Lauren Dillon, who is a climate activist, 17 year old, who has uh, been in the Sustainable Hour a couple of weeks ago. We interviewed her together with two of her friends from her school, and she's been giving some really amazing speeches, uh, first at the climate strike uh, on a Friday here in Geelong, and then at an anti-gas rally. And uh, she's with us also in this interview that we're doing with her father, who decided to stand or, or run for for the Senate. Um, so over to you, a little bit about the background and the story, how it all happened. Yeah, so I actually came to Dad and I... I was reading him my EES submission for the Viva Energy proposal. And at one point, one of the last things I was saying is how um, I'm not quite certain about my decision to have children in the future because it's quite a big thing um, with what's happening in our world at the moment with so much turmoil. And I think that night I just kind of broke down crying and um, I think you were just you were hugging me so tight trying to like, keep it together um, i didn't know what to do like i wanted to cry with you but then as it's old male rubble that i am i'm thinking i can't do that that would show weakness and that wouldn't get us in the right direction. i've got to show strong enough i've got to show some help to get you through this but i don't know where i could go with it it was all quite i'm in turmoil inside <laughs> and i don't know how to express it to you mm, yeah and um so we just kind of spent the night you know talking over it and that kind of stuff and then I think it was maybe a couple of days or a week later and dad spent a very long time on his um of, you know on his submission it was only two days that he had to do it but he he put his all his might into it um and I was very proud of him for doing that um and even reading it like yeah it just showed how passionate and you know connected he was to the issue because I think that yeah, sometimes as young people, we don't really see our um, parents' connection to things that we care about. So that was very nice to actually see how much I'd been able to impact him. And then a couple of days later, you came out and said you wanted to run for, yeah, House yeah. of Representatives. So, so the way it sort of rolled out was I'm pretty familiar with all the Geelong region. I've grown up here, I've been here 65 years, and I've worked all around Victoria and all sorts of industries. I'm an accountant by trade, but I started off as a factory worker. I worked as a heavy press operator as a 17-year-old at Fords. Rode my bike 24k each day to get there and back again. I thought it was a great little job because it was paying four times the doll payment. So I would get there and go working at Fords, and there was only one other person in the whole factory who spoke English, a man called Ronnie Dunstan. And Ronnie Dunstan and I made lunch on the talk because it was, it was the League of Nations. It was fantastic. But whenever there was a conflict in the world between two countries, those guys at the production line would be giving each other heck over, you know, your people in your country, you're doing this to me. The long and short was I was there for a few weeks and then another guy who started with me, the same age, he got a different job. He was working as an apprentice in the stamping plant right beside us. So the presses are going up and down making bonnets for these falcons and he's on one that's being repaired and something went wrong in the process. So this man who was 50 metres from away from me, a 17-year-old boy, he was crushed to death and all that came out the side of the press was juice and his belt buckle. And I thought there's got to be a better world than working in this. And most of those guys that worked there had been there all their life. And I'm thinking, here we are with a massive producer doing spectacular stuff, the heart of Geelong, the banner of the Geelong Football Club, and a 17-year-old kid's being killed before everyone's eyes. Going, there were safety systems, but something went wrong. Look, the best laid systems don't always guarantee a good outcome. So then I changed jobs around the place, do different things. I've worked with the State Revenue Office, Public Transport. I've been the business manager for Bowen Health's community mental health services. I've worked at Hesse Rural Health, Colic Area Health, Winchester Health, uh, all these different jobs all around Victoria, State Revenue Office, Public Transport, all these different categories. So I've seen how government works. I've written uh, ministerial briefings. I've been there when we've been forced to sell assets because the state's been bankrupt, all this sort of gear. So if this comes up, I've just gone and retired off having my own business as a vineyard uh, out of Bannockburn. I'm a CPA by trade. I I, I'm around people from all ethnicities. I'm a white collar, blue collar. Get my hands dirty. I've just spent 18 months on my hands and knees, actually doing a physical rebuild of a heritage house to maintain its perfect fit within the community, rather than putting some plastic glass steel box on the back of it. All right, there. Lauren comes up and says this, and then the last thing she said that night at midnight, when she's consoling herself, was just turned to me and looked in the eye and said, "Well, what have you done, Dad? What have you done for the environment here? In all the years you've been here." And I reflected on all those times that I've written a letter to the editor, that I've, I've phoned a politician, that I've sat on someone's doorstep, that I've talked about it with my neighbours and stuff. 
and nothing has changed. We have all been victims to what the system has offered us and the people in that 1% of the elite or the 1% of the, the crazy extremes are dictating what's going on around us. And I wasn't happy with that. So as we said, we got onto that um, Shell refinery. Uh, now, I had a couple of brothers that worked there doing shutdowns and repairs there for years and some of the stories about how uh, risky the whole infrastructure is and how it's all been the basis of uh, good luck rather than good management that saved us from a big explosion. And I reflected on what happened in Lebanon uh, 18 months ago when that massive uh, stockpile on the bay there, which is nitrates, went up. Now, that particular refinery we have here has got all that fuel stored up there, jet fuels and diesels and the whole lot, a cracker tower right there in the middle of it that's putting out a three-metre flame 24-7. Between that and where this LPG is going to go, the big billets, is a huge stockpile of Incitec pivot, the same sort of nitrate that blew up in Lebanon. And then they're going to go and put these uh, gas billets there. And I looked at it, I thought, okay, well, I'll read the document to see whether it's going to be stable enough or not. And then I could see the whole process is saying, essentially, that because these things aren't on the land, we don't have to really comply with the proper AES system that you would on the land. These things are just tethered. So we're only going to have uh, domestic plumbing piping. We're only going to have uh, an extra four hours of diesel to go and run the fire hoses on these things that starts to go. And we're going to hope that the, uh, the Bowen people at the port are going to have some extra special boats that can spray water on it and keep it calm. But at the end of the day, they're going to the industry standard, and that industry standard to say, if we have a trouble with the LPG, we're going to vent. Vent means release it in the atmosphere. And you think, okay, emissions. Now, hang on, 400 metres away is this constant flame. And between the two and that stockpile is all this nitrate. Lebanon was going to be like one-tenth compared to what we think it can do to Geelong if it ever goes wrong. So then you get on site and look at some of those things like Wikipedia, and they'll have a list for you on that site when you go and look at the Lebanon explosion of all the other explosions in the last five years around the world, big and small, and you go, this is possible. It's going on every day. We just don't see it because the countries might be third world or it might be controlled by the media. So the threat's real. And I also saw in their AES that they're saying things like, uh, you know, trust us, we haven't supplied this part to the commission yet. We're going to send one of those in later, but trust us. Now, from my background in government, when you look at these things, it's what we call a go, no go. When that thing goes to a commission, they should be saying, you haven't provided it, that makes a no-go, you haven't jumped the hurdle, you can't submit it yet. When you've got all your ducks in a row, then come back and see us. They haven't taken that position yet, but maybe when they come to the public hearings, they'll come to that conclusion. And even part of that, I think, was the minerals in the soil. Like, if we dredge this, we don't even know what is going to come out and could affect our marine life and even the local residents. Like, they've said that they've done um, tests on it, but they're not going to show it yet, and... That's part of the problem, you know, like it, we require transparency to actually see the threats of this issue. And, and sometimes what they offer us is, is to do what is considered the industry standard of the day. Uh, now, the industry standard might say that dredging with a big backhoe off the side of a, a barge is good. And as they described, they're just going to put it into some sort of um, barge containers and take it away to Point Henry and put it at a spoil ground where they just dump this stuff. To do this, they're going to actually disturb all that territory around there and all that stuff, when they fill up those barges, it's going to be water and muds. And it's going to overflow. And it's going to keep settling all around that bay and cause all sorts of renewed toxicity. This is right on the end of the Ramsar wetlands. Um, it's, it's a silly thing to do. And the process is the best in the world. They go around, if they want to do this, they put in a big suction pipe and they take this material out. None of it gets disturbed the turbidity back into the bay. It goes onto the land. They assess what the toxic levels are in it because this place has been leaking all sorts of things, benzenes and things in the water for since 1954. It's a cesspool under that surface. So the best thing they do is to get it where it can be seen and have it assessed individually, bucket by bucket, basically, and then say, okay, we can neutralise this, we can manage it, we'll, we'll decide on the right place to get rid of this disturbed soil. But no, they're taking the easiest way out because they're saying this is only going to be a 20-year investment and their, their push is to go and make money on it as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. And another thing I, I see in their responses is that I've gone back through another document from two years ago where they have put off doing their maintenance on the whole cracker tower and the whole lot there. They were going to spend $200 million, but they decided the life of this might not be that long. So they're just sitting there. You go past the refinery and look past the first ring of those big holding tanks, and you'll see other tanks that are rusting. The paint's coming off, the decay on the sides, particularly that top-edged area. Um, <laughs> they're not going to last 20 years. So they're doing their numbers. This is a big investment company, and they're saying, okay, if really this business is going to shut down because we're going to renewable so fast, we're not going to put an extra dollar in. Our share price has dropped from three dollars thirty-four to two nineteen at the moment. People are running away from us. You know, they know. They know what the shareholders around the world are saying. This is not the industry to be in. People like I love the one with um, 
Australian Gaslight, where at Atlassian wants to go and buy it out because they're not going fast enough to reduce their uh, coal for our powered electricity. The industry has said, we own these. We've got to shut them down because it's much cheaper to go for renewables. We don't need to be there. And investors are making their choices in superannuation funds all around the world to say, let's go where the sensible money is going. Let's get it across to something renewable because fossil fuels have had their day. So the next part I saw today, just taking it up to the current date, is I see in the paper that uh, there are supporters for this process. Two of the main supporters for this process out of fever are the Geelong Football Club and the Geelong Chamber of Commerce. Now, just before I got online with you, I went down and had a look at the uh, the board members of the Geelong Football Club. We're members. We love it. We go there all the time. It is the people's church. People go there, get a great spiritual experience from sitting in that outer, listening to the band, having a cheer, we win or lose. Part, of, part the of the community. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's uplifting. So I go through the board members and I'll just read out for you, not their names, but I'll tell you what their backgrounds are. And then you get surprised by two things. So we've got a board member. Uh, well, basically, they've been BHP, MMG, They've been uh, Viva subgroups. They've been on uh, COG gases. They've been with Alcoa. They've been with Newcrest Mining. Been... So to sum it up, they're, five, they're very biased. Five yeah. of the six have been in that industry sector. That's where they've come from. So are they going to be unbiased where they're going with it? And the next little silly game they've done here, and well, I've seen it in businesses before, is you don't get the, the CEO coming out. You don't get the president coming out criticising it. You take one step down. You have a fall guy. You get the finance man to go and say he's supporting it. Okay, so something goes wrong. It's not the footy club. It was a lower level. It looks like the footy club is supporting it, but they got that scapegoat. Mm. The next one is one of these people on there is actually also with the next biggest supporter with this Geelong Chamber of Commerce. And again, there's your connection. Now, I ask those people to do two things. Firstly, declare their interest. that They may potentially have a bias. And that doesn't necessarily mean that all 65,000 supporters of the club are behind it. Just, there's a few people with their own individual view. The second point is, when you look at that news article that was in the, uh, the Geelong Times today, um, they're saying support for it. Why? Where's your evidence? You, you've gone and taken lip service from what the have said, saying that they've done a great consultation with the community and that their safety records are fantastic. Analyse it one more step, guys. Turn the page, go down, do it all yourself, and you'll see what you're believing is not necessarily the truth. Mm. So, is that, <clears throat> so is that why you are... Uh making that big decision to, to run for parliament. Well, what, what happened then is because I started analysing what was going on with Shell and I was, oh, sorry, former <laughs> Shell, which is now Viva, um, and I thought, okay, how can that happen? And I'm also aware that where I am living right now in Belmont, I'm only a short distance from the Warren Ponds Creek, which is the boundary, boundary between Karangamite Shire and the Karayo Shire. Mm. And when we grew up here as five to six-year-olds, there was nothing over our back fence We were the last street in Geelong in Nagel Drive. And all that area, we used to walk across there as kids and we'd walk on the Roberts' farm. That was what Grovedale became. We'd shoot the rabbits okay. there. We'd go and fish on the ponds. We'd do all those sorts of things. We'd go and fill up our gun boots with the... Uh, with tadpoles and walk around them until they went squish over the top, oh, not, not realising what you were doing as kids, but we thought it was fun. Um, so the we, environmentalists in me yeah, just kind of died a little well, bit. Well, <laughs> that was a learning experience. You no, to <laughs> let's not get that far. But it, it takes you back to what things were like 60 years ago. It was a different world. We were in the country. Mm. We had we had seven orphanages ringing us around here. That's mm. what the world was like, orphanages on farms. Mm. So um, going back to that point, for all my life, I've seen Karangamite being a marginal seat, some boundaries being changed and people fighting over that 1% or 2% vote that changes the outcome for it. And that area gets all these pork barrel benefits. They forever get sports clubs. They get all these things. The, the Commonwealth Government is not responsibility for sports facilities, but they can come out there and offer these things at the last minute to try and get a vote across. If you look at, as I did, what you've got to do as being a candidate, you cannot offer bribes or inducement for somebody's vote. Yet they can come up with government money and throw millions, hundreds of millions of things at these things to go and persuade people to come and have a go at it. And if one side does it, the other one offers it. Mirrored across, Carayo. What have we ever been offered in Carayo? As one fellow put it to me, we only ever get our air changed and our tyres. That's as good as it gets. And, yeah, I think that's part of the problem. Like we've seen increasing... Um, increasingly that people don't trust democracy anymore like they don't trust our government at the moment and like when election times come up like people just become so switched off because they don't want to see all these you know attack ads or you know like another political thing and, and like us they hate it but they don't think they can ever change it yeah and so that's why I think dad kind of came across is because he wanted to try and change the system you know because we have to and 
He's got all these great ideas. He's got a big brain in him um, and he's quite <laughs> stubborn. So, Are you saying I've got uh, a big head? Well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Bit of a forehead though. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but, True yeah, enough. so he just kind of came across and we're aware that he might not win it because we're not, you know, he's not very well, well known see, at the moment. That, that's an interesting thing and and that's I'll we'll get onto that too because I'm going in it to win it because mm. I, I, I can see that there's a way to get me in mm. and that's a bit. So I'm not disappointed if I don't win, but I think the biggest trouble we have with so many of these little candidates is they're only going in there trying to chip at 1% of votes. And they should go in there saying, I really want to win it. I'm going to put in my best shot here because I'm going to take this seat. I'm going to teach them a lesson, not just take 1% off their vote. So for me, with my little analytical brain experience around Geelong and the different sectors around Australia and travel around the world, and you know, here I am pumping up my own tyres now, I started analysing the main person who's been in Cario for the last uh, 14 years. The history of Corio has been that it's been a safe Labor seat since Federation. The only time it changed was one day when, when Mr. Um, the current incumbent knocked off one of his fellow members because the people that were controlling the Labor Party wanted somebody that was further right in their factions. So I started doing those searches online and I decided I can't rely on just uh, an out there sort of source. So I actually went for government sources. And the government sources have things like people's declarations each time they start a term in office and what their uh, interests are. So here we are, all the poor people of Cario, the most disadvantaged of all of our zone within our region here. And we have a, a member that's been there for so many years who went to a school that the fees are $70,000 a year to go to that school, um, has three houses, has a salary of $382,000 a year, plus $86,000 a year for his office expenses. Plus, if we go back and I've got the documents here and anyone can find them online, um, he's been regularly getting paid over half a million dollars a year to run his office and supports in expenses. Now, there's no great dis description of what those expenses are, but this this is a phenomenal amount of money. And and then what are we seeing? So then I'd, I'd some more inquiries. If you go on to, online and just Google his name and see what comes up, and people will be making their own assessment of what comes up as to whether that's relevant and important to an election or not. But you'll also see things like in this last uh, process, we had job seeker running around. Now, the school that he went to got $10.7 million. This is a school that in that same year declared a profit of nearly $15 million. They could have funded it themselves. You had universities that weren't getting any jobs, job protection uh, during that time of COVID, and they were just left to their own devices. And they said the reason why they didn't do those, Josh Schreidenberg and others, is because oh, your model is based on overseas students. We don't need to support that. They're foreigners. If you look at the grammar schools process, they have a heck of a lot of overseas students too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but <clears throat> and I think that's, yeah. It's a bit disappointing when you see figures like that because um, a lot of people, I know kids at my school, were all reaching that kind of voting age and, um, like, they'll be like, you know, like, Lauren, you know a lot about politics, like, you're quite educated. Um, you know, like, I'm thinking of voting for the the current person, the current cry MP, um, and I was like, well, you know, like, what are you, what is your position on that? Like, why do you think you want to do that? And they they just say... You know, he has a nice smile. Like he, you know, he's just always been there. And my parents say that he's well, quite you know, and Lauren, the facts are, and this is not just, you know, hypothetical or anything. This, these are the facts that in the last election three years ago, 37% of the voters who were in the age from 18 years to 24 years, 37% of them voted for the Greens. Why did they do that? Mm. They did that because the Greens are, at the time, the best party to vote for if you want to see change for the climate and for the environment. That's that's a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, there's plenty of studies out there showing that the Greens are even stronger in the policies than than these teal independents. So, so the youth from 18 to 24 is voting for the climate and for the environment strongly. And I think you have an interesting uh, combination here, David, because with your alliance with a 17-year-old daughter, maybe you are creating a very unique uh, way of being an independent, where you speak for your daughter. I think, and that, that's part of what I'm trying to do here too, because you mentioned about the young people and how they vote. And I, I want to mention two points on that. There's been research presented in the Murdoch press saying that the young people so keen to get their vote, now they've got out there, there's a huge chunk of them ready to have their first vote, 
But they're saying with the reports they're presenting to us is that they're going to vote the same way as the parents, that they're going to do exactly the same as anybody under 40 has done because, and I, I question that. I think that's a manipulation of what the reality is. They're doing that to go and say, kids don't really get excited. Just go what your mum and dad say because the Murdochs want to get in who they want to get in. The second point is the history uh, since the incumbent in Cryo has been there up until the last election was that he always got the second votes, the pre preferences, second preferences from all the little minor parties. But in the last election, the Liberals managed to get them first. So he did a deal with the Greens, and I'm not going to give you too many details on that, to get their seconds. So the only thing that got him over the line in every one of these elections was he never got enough primaries, you needed somebody to second him. In the last election, it was the Greens, and the Greens people who voted for Greens never thought that this was going on behind them. Even the local man going for him, Simon, this year, didn't know that's what the state did to him. So Simon's in it this year. Simon's with the Greens. We've had some great communications, but I saw Simon yesterday at a protest. And he was with the banners for the Labor Party. So it's quite clear where his seconds are going this year. If you vote for the Greens in Carayo. Um, But, you know, back to that independent thing, I think that um, because my dad and I, like, we're, we have those conversations and we are quite open about, um, because I know some families that, you know, they'll shut off about, oh, it's political, like, you know, like I'm not sure I want to express that to you, but we're quite open. So I think that um, our kind of alliance, like you said it, can actually help make a difference because, like, I can tell them to please head in if it need be, you know, like. In the nicest possible Yeah, in the way. nicest possible or, way. Or they'll be, and, they'll be withholding a Tim Tam. And I'm glad that he's at least, you know, like um, going for this because he has policies and he has some of these good ideas. So even if they he doesn't get through, which I'm not saying that he won't, no. um, they'll at least be out there for everyone in, in the future. Someone might pick it up and that's part of what we're trying to do, I guess. Yeah. Or, and that, that is part of it. That's, this is my so, opus. It's one of those so, things. So, David, I can hear you're a, man, you're a man of many words. So can you, in a brief way, explain to us what are your policies <laughs> then? I think I'm approaching things from a different angle. I'm approaching it from the viewpoint of the 99%, not the 1%. And if people can take the time, if they've got half an hour and a, a nice soft couch and a good uh, internet connection, please go to my website, which is 1abcd.au. On that, you'll see that I am releasing a policy every day. Not a, sorry, not a policy, an initiative, okay? So I can't put a policy together as an individual. So my, I've got a policy going on there about the environment, about recognising that we can achieve these 50% deductions by 2030. We can achieve that. It's easy to do for the farmers, for the industry, for everybody around here. I've released a policy, sorry, I'm doing it again, an initiative, number one, that demonstrate how people that are renting out there in a house um, can get into their house and, and become a buyer in four to 10 years. So... Please, anybody who are renting, that's 30% of the people and 30% of the people out there are landlords or now rent providers, you'll see how this can benefit you. So if you're getting stressed by the finances, it's an option. The next one I've got out there, we're talking about how to get health services to you as fast as you can. And I've got a, one in there that's because I know the health sector so well, look at how we can change things in it. It's a few pages long. It needs great detail for people to get their heads around it, but it means that you're going to get your health services much better, much cheaper, more efficiently by doing a few of these changes. So I'm not uh, changing the world and saying this is all my policy. I'm saying something like uh, residential aged care. There's been a Royal Commission. It tells you what the things need to be. Behind that, there's been other investigations into the privately owned nursing homes. It tells you what things need to be. I'm saying, please, let's follow that. Let's get behind it. Sit down for a minute, read what's out there, get your head around it so you become more um, informed because it's all about knowledge. You either... Uh, educate yourself and become informed and get the knowledge or you've got to pay someone else for it. If you're paying someone else for it, it's very expensive and you're getting their opinion, not necessarily the facts. Anyone who's ever worked with a lawyer's opinion on something knows that. That's mm. where I'm going. So if people get a chance, pop in there every day and see what new one's up and see where that relates to you. But let's say that the Senate gets very strong with Clive Farmer and One Nation and people who are in bed with the fossil fuel industry and now there's a vote and you have been voted in. Uh, how, which stand are you going to take when it comes to these sort of, you know, oh, this is either we go renewables, yep. which might yep. cost something more, things. or or that we, we, we keep, you know, extending the life of, of the old coal-fired power stations and, and all that? Yeah. Just one short sentence. Whose side would you go for? I don't want any of those old fossil fuels happening at all. I, I want to get there. I want to show people that they shouldn't be scared of it. 
that, that there are businesses out there that enable that to be shut down, to transition without anybody losing the gas coming out of there. And we see um, that it's possible. Like Tasmania's just come out. They're carbon negative now. Like, And that's most, mostly just because they've stopped clearing forests. And so, you know, there's clear solutions out there. Yep. And for anyone listening, don't worry. He will always be renewables, you know, like <laughs> with a daughter like me, you know, has to be renewables. And, and I'm also saying that it, it might be as black and white as that, but I'm also capable of running those discussions with people that aren't quite there yet to help them understand that. With somebody like Lauren doing her research as well, with her connection with the kids coming through, those kids are going to get so well informed that they're going to sit around having that Mother's Day discussion tomorrow and say, come on, Dad, which way are you going to vote and why? And start drilling down on them. What have you done, Dad, like this girl did to me four weeks ago? What have you done? Listen to our Sustainable Hour for the future.